chapter 2, section 7. But surely abolishing capitalism would restrict liberty. Many so-called anarcho-capitalists and other supporters of capitalism will argue that it would be authoritarian to restrict the number of alternatives that people can choose between by abolishing capitalism. If workers become wage laborers, so it is argued, it's because they value other things more. Otherwise, they would not agree to the exchange. But such an argument ignores the reality of capitalism. But by maintaining capitalist private property, the options available to people are restricted. In a fully developed capitalist economy, the vast majority have the option of selling their labor or starving or living in poverty. Self-employed workers account for less than 10% of the working population. Usually workers are at a disadvantage on the labor market due to the existence of unemployment and so accept wage labor because otherwise they would starve. We'll be covering more about this uh, in uh, chapter 10, section 2 and why this is the case. And even if the majority of the working population desired cooperative workplaces, a capitalist market will not provide them with the outcome due to the nature of capitalist workplaces. See Juliet C. Shore's excellent book, The Overworked American, for a discussion of why workers' desire for more free time is not reflected in the labor market. In other words, it is a myth to claim that wage labor exists or that workplaces are hierarchical because workers value other things. They're hierarchical because bosses have more clout on the market than workers. And to use Shore's expression, workers end up wanting what they get rather than what they, getting what they want. Looking at the reality of capitalism, we find that because of inequality in resources, protected by the full might of the legal systems, we should note, those with property get to govern those without it during working hours and beyond in many cases. If the supporters of capitalism were actually concerned about liberty as opposed to property, their situation would be abhorrent to them. After all, individuals can no longer exercise their, their ability to make decisions, choices, and are reduced to being order takers. If choice and liberty are the things we value, then the ability to make choices in all aspects of life automatically follows, including during work hours. However, the authoritarian relationships and the continual violation of autonomy wage labor implies are irrelevant to these so-called anarcho-capitalists. Indeed, attempts to change this situation are denounced as violations of the autonomy of the property owner. By purely concentrating on the moment that a contract is signed, they blind themselves to the restricts of liberty that wage contracts create. Of course, anarchists have no desire to ban wage labor. We aim to create a society within which people are not forced by circumstances to sell their liberty to others. In order to do this, anarchists propose a modification of property and property rights to ensure true freedom of choice, a freedom of choice denied to us by capitalism. As we've noted many times, bilateral exchanges can and do adversely affect the position of third parties if they result in the buildup of power or money in the hands of a few. And one of these adverse effects can be the restriction of workers' options due to economic power. Therefore, it is the supporter of capitalism who restricts options by supporting an economic system and rights framework that by their very workings reduce the options available to the majority, who then are free to choose between those that remain. Anarchists, in contrast, desire to expand the available options by abolishing capitalist private property rights and removing inequalities in wealth and power that help restrict our options and liberties artificially. So, does an anarchist society have much to fear from the spread of wage labor from within? Probably not. If we look at societies such as the early United States or the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution in Britain, for example, we find that given the choice most people preferred to work for themselves, capitalists found it hard enough to find workers to employ, and the amount of wages that had to be offered to hire workers were so high that to destroy any profit margin. Over, uh, moreover, the mobility of workers and their laziness was frequently commented upon with, workers uh, with employers despairing at the fact workers would just work enough to make ends meet and then disappear. Thus, left to the actions of the free market, it's doubtful that wage labor would have spread, but it wasn't left to the free market. 
In response to these problems, capitalists turned to the state and enforced various restrictions on society, the most important being the land, tariffs, and money monopolies. In free competition between artisan and wage labor, wage labor only succeeded due to the use of state action to create the required circumstances to discipline the labor force and to accumulate enough capital to give capitalists an edge over the artisan production. Thus, an anarchist society would not have to fear the spreading of wage labor within it. This is simply because would-be capitalists, like those in the early United States, would have to offer such excellent conditions, workers' control, and high wages as to make the possibility of extensive profit from workers' labor nearly impossible. Without the, uh, without the state to support them, they will not be able to accumulate enough capital to give them an advantage within a free society. Moreover, it's somewhat ironic to hear capitalists talking about anarchism denying choice when we oppose wage labor, considering the fact that workers were not given any choice when the capitalists used the state to develop wage labor in the first place. 